Welcome to C-SPAN 2's Afterwards. My name is Ezra Klein from the Washington Post. I'm here with uh, Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubner to talk about their hit new book, Super Freakonomics. So thank you both for being with us here today. Thanks, Ezra. Thank you. So to begin, tell me a bit about how we got to Freakonomics. You, you have up in one of the early chapters uh, a bit about the name, and this is one of the sort of big brands in economic publishing now, but, but it almost didn't happen. What were the other names? Oh, they're so bad. They're so embarrassing. <laughs> they're so bad. The worst one was E-Ray Vision. You like you like it. I know, I like it. Two but days it's ago, terrible. I like I've it, always maintained terrible. that was bad, even though it was my idea. E, the idea was E-ray vision, E-ray being economics mm -hmm. as being the special <laughs> power to look through, and there'd have to be some kind of character with a big cape and an <laughs> E on his back. But my favorite, that was bad, but it was a it was a great bad one. Was so we should say Levitt's sister, Linda Gines. Uh, came up with free economics and it was great because we had this book that was kind of about nothing everything and nothing so it was hard to name it properly so it needed a kind of nonsensical name but her other great terrible name was bend it like veblen which i think <laughs> you have to acknowledge is so bad that it might be the best name ever but alas we didn't choose it it, it would have been funny <coughs> watching people in the future try to try to make sense of <laughs> bend it like veblen or in the present actually but yes but so as you said it's a book of, it's a bit about nothing a bit about everything and so what's the project what what's what's the project of free economics I don't know if there's a project exactly. I think uh, I've spent a lifetime studying economics in my own way, using the tools of economics, like models and like thinking about incentives and look, using data to figure out the difference between correlation and causality, but applied to a different set of questions, right? The first book looked at crack selling gangs and looked at cheating sumo wrestlers, cheating teachers, whether your name mattered. A set of topics that no self-respecting economist would ever take on, but you know, I'm a different kind of economist. I don't I don't know anything about the macro economy. I don't know anything about financial crisis, but uh, you know, but I kept myself busy studying these topics, and somehow, some way, they turned out to be interesting to everyday people. And before we dive into some of the actual studies in here, two things for I think the, the listeners would be helpful. One is the difference, as you said, you're not a macroeconomist, you're a microeconomist. So uh, a quick word on the difference there, and also about the natural experiments, which you're known for, which sure. are a bit different, I think, than how people normally think of, um, of economic research being conducted. Absolutely. So economics is divided into two big camps, macroeconomics and microeconomics. Macroeconomic, <coughs> macroeconomics is what most people think of when they think of economics. It's about interest rates, it's about GDP, uh, recessions, uh, and macroeconomics is hard. Right? The economic system is complex. How millions and, or billions of individual behaviors aggregate up into an economy is a question that really we haven't had all that much luck making sense of. It's, it's sort of you know, made clear by some of the recent going on. Now microeconomics is about individual behavior. Uh, it's a way of saying can I predict what you were going to do when I put you in a situation? Or maybe even easier, looking back, why did people act the way they did? And so that, that is microeconomics, the kind of thing I do. Any topic I describe, almost every one of them is about individuals or maybe firms at the biggest and how they make their choices. Okay, now you brought up this idea of natural experiments, okay, which I actually, for a, for a broader audience, I like to call it accidental experiments. Mm -hmm. But let me take a step back even from that into methodology. So the, the cornerstone of the scientific method is the randomized experiment. Right? When we decide whether the FDA should approve a particular drug, we go and we run randomized experiments. We see whether how what the drug works in a, in a double-blind experiment relative to a placebo, and we are able to just compare the people who got treated to the people who weren't. They were randomized, so the difference between the outcomes tells us whether or not that drug works. Okay? As an economist, as much as I would love to carry out randomized experiments, it's not always possible. So, for instance, we talk in the book about how you know I'd love to know, one of the questions I want to know is, do prisons reduce crime? But it's not like the NSF is going to allow me to go out and run a randomized experiment where I lock up a bunch of people in one state at random and I randomly release a bunch of people in another mm -hmm. state and then see what happens, right? So, so in that kind of a world, a complex world we live in, economists have had to use what I call accidental experiments to figure out the answer. So in other words, I look for quirks where you know, something like a law change or um, like, so if you want to talk about abortion and crime, so I have a theory, a controversial theory about uh, how abortion, legalization of abortion in the 1970s reduced crime in the 1990s. Okay, so there, it's certainly not a random experiment, but after abortion became legal in some states in the 70s, it was very easy to get an abortion. In other states, it was very hard. So you can compare 20 years later what happened in the states where it was easy to get an abortion 
to those states where it was hard to get an abortion. And that's what we would call an accidental experiment. And it's really kind of the new wave of, of microeconomic research is to not just look for pure correlations, but to go deeper and to try to find evidence of these sort of these experiment, the quasi-experiment. So you try to think, what can I do that's cl as close to replicating a scientific experiment as possible? And now even uh, economists are getting into running randomized experiments more. So uh, one of my colleagues, John List, who we talk about a lot in superfeconomics, is really at the cutting edge of field experiments. So not going into the lab with college students and asking them to do things they're not used to, but really going out into real world settings when people don't know they're being watched and trying to learn from their behavior where you truly do randomize. And how do you separate this from psychology, from, uh, from sociology, from other disciplines, right? I mean, uh, economics occasionally gets accused of, I think, what people call economic imperialism, where, where you folks go and you begin to sort of plant your flag in, in what other folks consider their discipline. So, you know, how is this different from psychology? How do the techniques differ? Should yeah. we listen to you or psychologists on how people act? Oh, probably both? both. I think a little of both. I mean, I think that psychologists tend to ask different questions, right? So. Mm -hmm. If an, if an economist and a psychologist ask the same question, then uh, the methods we're using when you're going to randomized experiments now, would be similar. Although psychologists rarely, if ever, venture out of the lab. Psychologists have decided that the lab is the perfect kind of sterile environment in which you can learn everything you can and you have complete control. Economists have really, John List and, and myself in particular, have been much more critical of the lab because it is an artificial environment. And one of the things that psychologists know well is that depending on how you run an experiment, you can get a college student to do just about anything, right? And so uh, for the questions that psychologists are interested in, it's often about motivations, right? They're trying to, they're almost more interested in how you manipulate people into doing things than in extrapolating outside the lab to how people will behave in the real world. And really, I think that's an important distinction. Economists tend to be interested in, will this tax do what we think it will. And, and psychologists tend to be interested in how will people feel about the tax. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, you know, in general, a lot of the topics I study do overlap with sociology. They're sociological in nature. But I ask them in a very different way than sociologists do. Now, sometimes I team up with sociologists, like Sudhir Venkatesh, when I work on gangs mm -hmm. and my work on prostitution. And then we try to bring both pieces of it. But I, if you ask a sociologist, they won't confuse my work with sociology because I very much stick to using the economic tools, the same tools that economists have used for hundreds of years to try to study markets and, you know, uh, and, and, and prices and quantities. I've taken out to study questions like, you know, does education work or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, does it work? Education. You know, the returns to education are huge. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I'm not saying our education system is mm -hmm. perfect, but if you look at people who get more education and, it, and, and really at the causal effect of getting an extra year, the economists say uh, an extra year of education is worth about 8% to um, your lifetime earnings. So it's a really good return. Now, eventually you get too much education, it starts to hurt you. Getting a PhD, the more years you get, once you get a PhD, your wages actually start to go down. But, but you're not just buying, you know, when you get a PhD, you're buying a a comfortable life like the one I live where you get to you know do whatever you want but um, so look I think there's a lot to fix on education I'm working on it as well but but by and large I mean, we have a, we do have a, not such a bad agenda I mean, people come from all over the world we're, we're very much are importers of people coming to, to buy mm -hmm. our you know people want to buy our educational system at the higher level so I think we have a lot to be proud of uh, nonetheless and so the other blend of disciplines in the book com comes on your side as a reporter and so the book ends, it ends up sort of being interesting, where sort of one chapter will be about a very deep data set, and another chapter will be, you know, what I sort of more rec what I recognize being a reporter as more traditional reporting, a long interview with a source, you know, mm -hmm. um, going out into the field, mm -hmm. going to events and watching how people react, and yeah. you know, trying to take a, a the sort of the pulse of a cultural moment or an intellectual moment here. And so, how do those work together? I mean, they, they are very different disciplines, and they are sort of empirically. Um, Though, though I love my job and I imagine yeah. quite like yours, we're, we're at a sort of different level of rigor yeah. than, than other Stephen here. If you notice the divide that well, that's bad, a bad sign on our behalf because they're meant to really, I, shouldn't, I don't mean to trash us um, entirely, but uh, we do try to marry them. Um, you know, maybe you're more perceptive than the average reader because that's the kind of work you do. A lot of people, when they're reading about even some of the empirical stuff, they don't really think of it as research versus reporting. And when they think about a kind of uh, <clears throat> a character narrative, they may not think about that as research versus reporting or versus empirical. But yeah, we try to basically create a hybrid um, of a few different things. Empirical research that may have any of five or ten different, you know,